One of the most important forces in electromagnetic physics is called the Lorentz force. We have a magnet with a north pole and a south pole, and then an electron or any other charged ion curves around the north pole and the south pole because it has its own magnetic fields which need to align with the north pole and the south pole. And you can see these little fields north-south all inside of the electron. And when this happens, there's no change of velocity for the electron. It just curves in a circle. That's called the Lorentz force, and it's very common in physics. I'll show some examples of the Lorentz force from the laboratory soon. Turn the magnet on its side and place a horizontal current arc in the center. Then you see a huge Lorentz force going upward. Next, if we simply reverse the polarity of the magnet and put a horizontal arc in the center, we see a huge Lorentz force going downward. Another important force in electromagnetic physics is called the lens force. We have a magnet laying on its side with its north and south poles, and as we push toward that magnet a coil of copper wire or some other conductor, it creates a repulsive magnetic field N' prime and S' prime, due to motion of electron through the wire, which repels the first field, and we get a big change of velocity of electrons in the wire. I'll show you some examples of the lens force by experiment soon. Here we have a wire pancake coil of about a thousand turns, half millimeter wire. We hooked it up these two wires to a voltage controller over here and to an isolation transformer for safety, which we put 240 volts in or any voltage we want really at will. And then we take an aluminium plate, which is three millimeters thick and 150, a little bigger than the coil. And we put it on top of it. And then when we turn on the power like this, the coil jumps up in the air. Both the Lorentz force and the lens force are easily understandable in terms of internal magnetic fields of the electron. But we have to ask ourselves why? You can see these magnetic fields curving around the electron south, north, north, south, south, north, north, south. As the electron moves with relative velocity, they call this the right hand rule, and everybody memorizes it, but nobody can explain why it happens. And that's the key to the phenomenon. Now we'll explain why, and you'll never forget. The reason why all of these things are happening is that spin in four dimensions equals magnetism in three dimensions. If we have a stationary object with delta V equals zero moving forward through time T, there's a spin motion but we can't see it because it's moving forward through time. Then if that object picks up a big delta V to move sideways with a different time T, like in special relativity, the spin motion shows up as plus or minus X, plus or minus Y, plus or minus Z motions in three dimensions. And that is what we see here. Magnetism in three dimensions comes from spin in four dimensions. Here's an electron moving sideways. If it has a small delta V, you see a small circular motion plus or minus X plus or minus Y. If it has a big delta V, you see a big circular motion, plus or minus x, plus or minus y, and they all follow the right-hand rule. Everything is right-handed.
conclude, we would also like to know how big the magnetism gets depending on how fast the electron is moving. And that's what's called special relativity. If we have an electron which is stationary relative to us just moving through time, there's a spin motion which we can't see. But if we have an electron which has a big relative motion to us, a different time, t prime, then we see circular motions plus or minus x, plus or minus y, plus or minus z. And there's a certain angle through time between time and space, which I call theta. And the key formula is sine theta equals v over c to tell how much the time is dilated and how big the magnetism gets. You won't see this in textbooks anywhere, but it's very, very simple, isn't it? Now it's really easy to see how a plasma railgun works. We have two wires, positive red, negative black, and we're going to put 6.6 .6 kilovolt of DC power between them. Turn it on. You just get a simple arc. When the air gets ionized, N plus and O plus ions go to the black wire, electrons go to the red wire. Now let's see what happens when we put a magnet beneath these wires. Now we've put a ring magnet with North Pole facing up between those two wires. Let's see what happens to the arc when we turn on the DC power. You can see the flame is growing strongly to the right. We flip the ring magnet over so that the South Pole is pointing up. Now let's see what happens to the arc. It goes strongly to the left. Turn the magnet on its side and place a horizontal current arc in the center. Then you see a huge Lorentz force going upward. Next, if we simply reverse the polarity of the magnet and put a horizontal arc in the center, we see a huge Lorentz force going downward. This is a linear railgun using air on a track of magnets with the current going in reverse. Let's watch the ionized air move in reverse from right to left. Today we are going to do a quick study of Lenz Law Levitation. Here we have a wire pancake coil of about a thousand turns, half millimeter wire. We hooked it up these two wires to a voltage controller over here and to an isolation transformer for safety which will put 240 volts in or any voltage we want really at will. And then we take an aluminium plate which is three millimeters thick and 150, a little bigger than the coil. We put it on top of it, and then when we turn on the power like this, the coil jumps up in the air. The reason is, when the AC magnetic field flips back and forth in this coil 50 times per second, 240 volts, it creates repulsive magnetic fields in this aluminium sheet that lift it upward. 
they curl one way and then the other. Final, final demonstration of the physics. We're going to take a 200 millimeter sheet of aluminium, which is three millimeters thick, and put it over the top. Floats up quite nicely. But if that aluminium sheet has any kind of cuts in it, like this, it won't float at all. Or if it even has curve cuts, won't flip at all, whereas the intact sheet of exactly the same thickness floats nicely. So what we learn from this is the eddy currents from this AC copper disc take big paths around the aluminium sheet. First they go that way and the next cycle they go that way. And if we put cuts in the sheet like that, the eddy currents can't flow and it won't levitate. Even spiral cuts it won't levitate. It has to be a full sheet so the currents can flow to make it go up or down that way over this coil. Even when there's practically zero flow of argon gas to the tube, look how much thrust we get. That's at 60 watts.